Hello, I'm Peter Hillary, and I'm here with Vanessa O'Brien, who's a climber who's climbed the Seven Summits, and then just last year became the first woman to reach Earth's highest and lowest points, so Mount Everest and the Challenger Deep. I had the opportunity to spend some time with Vanessa during an expedition to South Georgia and the Falkland Islands. And so I'm one of the few people who've met uh, Jonathan, who she refers to as Spousey in her book. Her first memoir is called To the Greatest Heights, How I Faced Danger and Found Humility on This Expedition Called Life. Hello, Vanessa. Hi, Peter. Great to see you. How are you? Oh, look, I'm, I'm well, and it's great to catch up again, particularly around this, this new publication that, that you've um, produced. But, you know, one of the first things that comes to mind for me is, you know, you've come out of a, a life of living in big cities, New York and London, working in the financial sector, and then suddenly something happened. You went off and started doing incredible things. What happened? Oh, wow. Um, this is a, a, a great tee-up for the book, uh, To the Greatest Heights. Um, well, you don't need a catalyst for change, but I certainly had one. I had the uh, the Great Recession, which was um, a point in time around, um, uh, gosh, uh, 10, 11, 12 years ago. And uh, for me, it was a point in my life where I needed a change and I was looking for something to do. And it also involved a, a, a change in my life where I was living somewhere new in Hong Kong. And as I was looking for something completely different that had nothing to do with financial services, which was my previous work environment, um, I was inspired by all the tall buildings around me and walking and just exploring this new environment. And um, I think in the book, I say there's several versions of the story and all of them are true, but uh, a penny drops and someone says, why not climb Everest? And that's sort of the backbone of where this um, very dramatic story takes us as I start with that challenge. And, and sort of when the penny drops, I think Everest, 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 Everest. And it sort of echoes like that, um, that series that was on uh, To the Limit, Everest to the Limit. And I start thinking, where is it? How high is it? Um, of course, it had been climbed before by your father and, um, uh, you know, Tenzing Norgay, but uh, although it had been climbed then, it was being climbed now or then. And uh, the question was always, would I have it in me? Could I do it? And uh, that's when the whole research and everything started to unfold. So how did you train? for an Everest expedition? You know, living the big city life, tall buildings, um, how did you transition into becoming a, an Everest mountaineer? Because Everest expeditions are long. You know, you're out there for two and a half, three months. You go up, you go down, you go up, you go down, you get knocked back by the weather. Um, you have to be very fit. You have to be mentally attuned. Yeah, so this is uh, this is an interesting story that uh, takes place over a couple of different chapters. One is you don't really know what you don't know. So as I'm reading and researching all of these things about Everest, I realize that I need to learn how to climb. So obviously that's um, you know that's missing, and so I I am training in that I have you know the physical fitness part of it in in terms of. Um, you know, uh, hiking and, and aerobic and, you know, a little bit of weight training and all, and all of that. But what I needed was also the mountaineering skills. And so I do actually go down to your your neighborhood over to Fox Glacier and um, and meet with Mark Sedan. And uh, he takes me up to Fox Glacier and uh, helps me understand what all that technical climbing kit is. So you know, what the helmet is, what the crampons are, you know, how to use a harness, um, you know, what, what all the what all the climbing stuff is. And, and laboriously, we go up and down. And that's when I first discover what the Kia birds are. And, and um, we have some fun um, on that particular uh, trek. It's just the two of us. 
And, and then I come down and of course, you know, I realize that there aren't a lot of places that you can really practice, um, you know, mountaineering skills unless you're, you're on a mountain. And so it became really about where do I take the mountaineering skills now that I've had this sort of crash course. And I guess uh, I had been on, um, I had climbed Kilimanjaro, so I was familiar with what altitude felt like. Uh, I was, I had one goal and that was uh, Everest. So I thought, okay, the way they sold Everest was really in three, three types. It was base camp, camp two and the summit. And I knew I was not prepared for the summit. I knew that Kilimanjaro was higher than Everest Base Camp and that I had been there and that Everest Base Camp was just a trick. So Camp 2 sounded just perfect in the Goldilocks model of, of uh, you know, mountaineering. And so I, I had planned for Everest Camp 2. And then um, as the story unfolds, of course, I missed the forest for the trees because my straight red card would be not understanding that the Kumbu Ice Fall was the first thing out of Everest Base Camp. <laughs> and that's where it all goes wrong. Yeah. So tell me, you know, most people find high altitude very, very challenging. They feel debilitated and weakened and, and psychologically affected. How did you cope with, with that? It, it's interesting. Um, it, it's hard to describe high altitude. And in the book, I, I describe it a couple of different ways. First, I, I do take a, a trip down memory lane to talk about that first uh, Kilimanjaro trip that I did in 2005, merely because, well, <clears throat> the Swahili guides are trying to tell me about acclimatization. It's a hard thing to talk about. So I'm running up the hill and having fun and, and they're like, poly, poly, you know, slow down slowly, slowly. And I'm like, oh, you know, we're all having fun here. And then all of a sudden it just smacks me. And I just have, you know, feet like two cement logs, you know, and I can't move. And then it finally, they, they laugh at me and they say that, that is high altitude. You know, and so it dawns on me that it's the kind of thing that, wow, you know, the body has to adjust to very, very slowly. And later, of course, I learn about the red blood cells and, you know, uh, AMS, uh, acute mountain sickness and all these other things and, and the reason we go slow. But when you're first learning and people are talking about this, it's this mysterious thing that happens. And so, you know, until you, until you, so it's like, it's like when you tell a child, don't, don't put that plug or don't touch that socket. You know, nobody understands this mysterious thing that happens until you do it wrong and then you get shocked, you know. So anyway, uh, high altitude, I became more and more familiar with the more I went there. The, the bad news is unlike training and other things you might build a, um, a tolerance for or become good at through training, High altitude is one of those things that, that that's always um, that's always going to start from scratch. You're never going to build a competency for it. it every time you start, it's always starting fr from the beginning. So I can do it over and over again, and then I start again, and I have, again, the same roll of the dice. I may or may not get it. And it's the one thing that is just so frustrating. It's, it's always as if by climbing more, you could get better at acclimatization when in fact, there's, there's no um, science that says that there's a relationship to the more that you climb, the better you are at acclimatization. It always seems to be a zero sum game at the beginning where it's a crapshoot and maybe you have you know, the same chances of success or failure. But, but the difference is that you know what the signs are so you can recognize it early. Yeah, you become more experienced, or I guess you're, you're managing your systems better, but you have to go through it again. But I guess the other thing you would have experienced, particularly going into the Kumbu Icefall, is unlike, say, Kilimanjaro, is the risks. That it's a pretty dangerous place. Big towers of ice topple over, and if you're in the wrong place, you're, you're in the wrong place. Um, and in the book, you do start with a, a rather 
unsettling scene uh, about coming across on one of your expeditions a boot, obviously the remnants of someone who had died. How did that affect you? How did the risk nature of this high altitude mountaineering caper affect you? Yeah, so the book does open with a, with a pretty grim scene. It's um, it's where I'm uh, taking some DNA samples from uh, a pair of boots because I am hoping to find a father and son who had perished on K2. And uh, it's very, very, very rare that you would see two boots side by side. I mean, almost impossible. And, you know, we see a lot of things on the glacier all the time, but never, rarely, very rarely ever something side by side. And um, uh, uh, I, had, I had so wanted to uh, try to solve this puzzle because I, I really feel um, that, uh, you know, families grieve, especially when they're when they lose loved ones and there is no body, it's it's hard uh, when suddenly somebody just doesn't come home, and it's it's hard to reconcile um, their disappearance. It's it's somehow surreal, like they might return, and it's it's very very hard when when you never see them again. Um, so it, it's uh, for me, it was it, it it's it's. I used humor throughout the book, so I, I should just say that it's it's a funny book um, in as much as climbing has a lot of, um, you know, very funny things that happen to us when we're out there. But in, in the scene itself, I, I do try to contact the person to say, were they wearing this brand of boots? And I don't hear from them, so I continue through it. And then at the end, she tells me that, that they were not wearing this brand of boots. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, all the words that you would possibly say, because of course, if I knew that up front, I would never have, you know, broken the bones and cut through the tissue and put them in the dish and stored them and, you know, gone through all this agonizing, you know, uh, stuff that would give me nightmares for a, a short period of time. But, but I would absolutely do it again in a heartbeat if I thought I could help anybody further uh, a healing process, which is uh, ultimately very important. And, you know, I would go on to find other things, you know, rings and stuff. And, you know, you always want to try to return something if, um, you know, if, if it would be important to the family. And it's just a part of, of you know, the mountaineering. Um, and the mountain continues to sort of flush these things uh, down the mountain over time. Um, it, we, if we are witness to that or can, can rescue those things, then, of course, we're there to do that. Um, and, and it's an honor to do that, even though it's uh, gruesome. Yeah, no, look, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to do to help other people deal, deal with their grief. But when you're up there yourself, you have to acknowledge that you're in the face of whatever the mountain throws at you or, or whatever happens to you. Um, what, what do you think about that, the impacts on uh, Jonathan, on, on family and friends, how, how do you make sense of that yourself? Yeah, I think, uh, well, the, the, for the most part, I think it's, it's just, it's put outside of, it's put outside my head completely. I, you know, I'm, I'm worried about the next step. I'm worried about, you know, the next call, the next play. I'm, I'm definitely not thinking at all about any of that at all. Um, there's just too much to worry about and too much to plan and, you know, the weather stuff, there, there's just, even in the downtime, you're still planning or your mind's focused on something forward looking. But I will say the only time I came close to a thought like that is on the, the third year on K2, the summit year, and that's in a scene where, um, where I'm with Norbu Tenzing um, of the Himalaya Trust and Jim Clash, where, where Jim Clash gives me his ring, that Mario Andretti ring. And, um, and he says, uh, make, making sure he's looking at me, make sure you bring it back. And I know... <laughs> now I, there's responsibility. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I know what that ring meant to him. This is like, and I say in the book, this is like, um, you know, uh, oh, 
a Super Bowl ring. It's the kind of thing you would wrestle Vladimir Putin over or something Vladimir Putin would try to steal. And I know what it meant to him. I know what it took for him to get it, driving with Mario Andretti. And I know that um, it was there to make sure I came back and didn't take any unnecessary risk. And the, the interesting thing and why it flashes back to me is because that's the year I find a woman's uh, arm with a ring on it. And this is this flashback to me and the symbolism that says, is this going to be you or not? Are you going to be the one who leaves the arm? Of course, the ring was around my neck because of uh, inflammation. We don't do that today. But the symbolism was the same in that, um, you know, th this could be you and um, you know, you, you better, you better watch out. And it just, it, it, it's the only time it brought me back in a way that was uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, in my mountaineering career, I, I've seen many instances where members of the media uh, and the public have questioned we mountaineers uh, about our motivations. Um, and they've quite often said, are, are you really all a lot of very, very self-engrossed or, or um, you know, selfish people? And, um, you know, I can, I can understand the question because, um, you know, we go out, we're away for months, there, there is high risk. Um, and, and, of course, that's part of the reason why we're there, to push ourselves to the, the absolute limit. But what do you think about that, 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 that issue of perhaps some of the community seeing these sorts of endeavors as um, very self-absorbed? Yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, for the most part, it, it could be seen as self-absorbed in that it's, I, I would not say it's not a solo pursuit per se in that I'm not Uli stuck. I'm not a soloist. I don't climb alone, but it is not say the same team sport as, uh, you know, I'm not in a league with the team that travels as a team to the same place all the time. Um, what, what we're doing is much more risky. So when you take K2 and you say, okay, for every four that climb or yeah, for every four that climb one dies, you know, of course, that's hard to get sponsors and things like that. But, but I would say, as in my career as, as a mountaineer, what I've done over time to mitigate that is I tried to make sure on all the expeditions that I give back in some way to climate change or knowledge in some way. So, you know, taking glaciers on, or taking samples of the glaciers on on the Austin Goodwin Glacier, for example, and being able to determine you know, the lead content going down 10 Nalgene bottles to see um, if there is any contamination, you know, something like that, because boots on the ground is important for sampling of glaciers. They can't get the machines way up there. It's too cost prohibitive, but the mountaineers provide useful agents to be able to capture that data. And so I think science is something that all mountaineers can do at very little cost if they partner with, with the universities and um, some of these uh, other organizations. Um, so one, I 100% I agree with that and incorporate that and encourage others to do so. Um, or, you, you know, to start and people start somewhere, uh, you can use your body as an experiment. So the very first thing I ever did was um, use myself as an experiment to see if acetazolamide or diamox would cause kidney stones. And there was uh, an assertion that too, you know, too much, too often would give you, would give you kidney stones. So start documenting. That's what I did. And I got them. <laughs> you know? So it, it's not fun, but it, it does serve, you know, to show that there is a direct correlation. So, um, and of course, I've, I've done things with hypoxic tents and, you know, so the thing is to make it less selfish, go out and show, you know, use, use ourselves as, remember where we are, we can even use our eyes 
you know, over three years climbing K2, I saw incredible, I, I was not on the same mountain. I saw incredible decay of the glaciers over three years. So you, you can't be a climate change denier, even over one mountain, you know, one year to the next. You can take pictures standing in the same place and show that. That's David Brashears was wonderful what he did mm -hmm. on Everest with that. You don't have to be even amazing or have a film crew. You know, just take your iPhone and, and you know, that's enough to document. Um, yeah. well, those are very, very important things. Real life observations by real people uh, carries a very strong message. And I think it's a great thing. But look, as um, a woman, I find this interesting. You see, I, when I was on K2, we joined forces with Alison Hargraves, and it was a, a disastrous year on the mountain. Um, uh, seven people died in the storm when we were attempting to get to the top, including Alison. But the point of my raising this is I was interested in the criticism that Alison received by many people in the media and the public of being a woman, of being a mother, of, of, of you know, her gender, being out there on a limb. How do you see this and, and how has this affected you? Yeah, I, I thought that was uh, very unfair because, um, you know, and I don't know if that was a, uh, you know, a function of the time, timing, uh, you know, of, of the time at which she climbed, but I, not necessarily, you know, I think if women had children today, they would still get looked at as being more selfish for leaving children at home, uh, you know, versus say, uh, if they were going down to the real estate office to uh, type away at a computer or something like that. Um, it, it, it's really unfair to cast those eyes and make those judgments uh, for anything that we do, because uh, one, life in general carries some risk, right? Um, you know, there, there's the things about walking across the street or getting hit by lightning or the, the odd and random things that just happens in life, much less just, uh, you know, picking up uh, the odd illnesses or, or things like that. Um, but but it's just also unfair for, for just looking at uh, two capable individuals who uh, want to go out and achieve something. And not everybody has the same um, drive and, and talent and ambition to do things. And even you mentioned uh, Spousey, as I call my husband in, in my book, but here <laughs> is here is my husband who would absolutely never in a trillion years even have the desire to visit those countries, much less, uh, you know, take a walk to base camp. It's just, it's not his thing. He, he just doesn't want to do it. Uh, from the walk to the, you know, and he's interested in history, don't get me wrong, there's aspects of it that would interest him, but uh, being uncomfortable, being in a tent, I mean, you know, Sleeping on a tent floor to him is, is why would you do that? He sees that as something completely, you know, insane in a, in a world that has mattresses and other choices. So there you go. But I, I think it's, it's wrong. It's, it's the wrong lens. I would hope that was slightly a function of the time. Um, and it's wrong to do it even for women who have children, because obviously um, both men and women bring up children it's not just the woman that brings up the children, but it's, of course, we grew out of a time that, you know, uh, it was cast where women were the, the homemaker and the men were the breadwinner, and this was a male-dominated sport originally. Yeah. At one point, you, you mentioned that you felt that you really didn't fit, you know, into, I, I guess, various perceptions that people had. I think at one point you were just talking about clothing sizes, but... Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so um, so I, I know the reference you're, you're speaking of. That's um, that's uh, so, so. There's quite a few things in the book that I disclose that are are very personal because it's a memoir. And actually, the I've had the question that said, "Wow, you know." In fact, everyone that I've everyone that I know 
has learned something new about me by reading the book, which is great. It, it says that I, I did a good job. Um, but the, the real question was whether something was in or out was whether it was deemed to help somebody else. If, if it could help somebody else, it stayed in. If it was just sensational, like useless stuff, it, it, it obviously went out. In that case, I, I'm talking about um, uh, some a breast reduction in particular when I talk about like a size uh, uh, 12 top and size 10 uh, slacks or something like that right. and saying, if, you know, when things don't fit, it's like you don't fit and it makes you feel awkward. Um, you know, and and body image is something, you know, women struggle with, I, I think, almost everywhere in the world. It's not something painted on one uh, one person or one nationality or anything like that. It's it's a typical thing. You know, there's we were just talking here about a woman being typecast as, you know, a stay at home mom versus somebody who could go to the mountain. But, you know, women are always, you know, objectified. Also, you know, whether they're, you know, good looking or not good looking, whether they're skinny, whether they have too much weight on them, whether they, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough world. And so, um, you know, in, in my case, it was um, something that my, my parent, my parents uh, helped me help lobby for, for the insurance company. I had the surgery and that was that, but there were ramifications. Obviously it left scars and scars uh, don't look good um, in, in certain situations, but uh, life goes on. So, um, but, you know, in terms of not fitting, I would say initially, you know, it was hard to, to fit in a mountaineering environment because I didn't have friends that climbed either. So, you know, my type of friends were, you know, were very girly girls and they did not see me as the climbing type who was going to go out and sleep in a tent or beat laundry on the side of a stream or stuff like that. So they, you know, and I was always a bit of an extreme person. So I was just at home in a five-star hotel as I was in a two-person tent. And that was sort of hard for people to get their head around because, it was like, it's the same person and, and it really is the same person, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it is extreme. Did, did your friends, I mean, did they sort of reconcile the two Vanessas in the end? You know, the one they perhaps met for a, a coffee somewhere in, in a big city to the person who went out and slept on a ledge at high altitude one wondering what was going to happen in the morning as you headed up in, into the whatever awaited you on the summit bridge. Did, how did they deal with that? You know, I, I think, uh, like one of them says in the book, I think they ended up sort of trying, they ended up coping by saying something like an action figure waiting to happen. Like they saw it more as, okay, you know, like, she obviously doesn't have a phone booth she changes into, but there's like a side of her that's like, you know, that's, you know, that's pretty fierce. And, and, you know, we may not see that if we're just like sipping a martini somewhere, but clearly she has like this, um, you know, uh, she's not afraid to, to, you know, go outside of her comfort zone. But that, that of course, going outside that comfort zone, you know, uh, as there was that other book that was written that shows because of going outside the comfort zone and really getting punched and punched and punched and having the mountain teach me all the lessons it taught me that that was really where, you know, the ego cracks open and I'm able to succeed. So I don't succeed really in my, the way I was in the beginning, I succeed after being kind of, um, um, if you will, rehabilitated uh, by learning through the mountains. Yeah. You know, there's a lovely piece in one of Wilfred Thesiger's books, um, just talking about how the deprivations, uh, living in a very harsh and difficult situation, actually magnifies the pleasure of when you do come back to a soft bed and good food and all the rest of it, it makes it so much better. 
Um, and I think I, I've seen that. And, and maybe that's 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 something you, you could talk to Jonathan about and see see if that works for him. But maybe he feels he gets that gets gets there um, gets there anyway. Look, you you are philosophical in this book, and you play around with um, the ideas of adventure and exploration and how they get defined, how they sit with you. How do they sit with you? Sure. So I think when I start out, I see adventure uh, more about taking on first the pursuit of Everest, which is how the book starts out. And I'm learning more just about myself. And as we were saying earlier, it's it's purely more of a selfish pleasure. You know, it's can I do Everest? And it seems to be only about the goal of Everest, which is also short-sighted because I think of it as the summit of Everest. And then down this continuum, it develops into, well, wait a minute. You know, the summit is not the goal. It's actually getting down, you know? So there's this awakening of, you know, what the real goal is. And then it's not really even just a goal anymore. It becomes like a sense of purpose. So suddenly it's getting elongated more. And there's this need to uh, fulfill something and give back uh, through exploration. And it's not that you learn everything about yourself, but you become so insignificant to what you're seeing out there that it, you, stop, you stop worrying about yourself. And everything else that you're seeing is so much more important. And you become more of an advocate to what can you do to help. And that's where I see the adventure starting. You become sort of a, a, an adventurer where you're learning about yourself to an explorer where you dedicate more time to trying to give back and do what you can to help anything that you can, you know, uh, give back to the world, whether it's taking those samples for the glaciers, whether it's uh, helping to identify medicines, you know, or anything futuristic, because that's so much more powerful and longer lasting. I mean, there really is an opportunity for a more holistic vision of the experience, isn't there? And I think that is something that you grow into as you, you do more of these, these expeditions that really push you. But what I, I really enjoyed was, was this quote, um, I was not giving up, not this time, not next time, not ever. That's an important attitude when you're climbing mountains like Everest and, and K2. But of course, it has to be tempered with a survival instinct. And you've shown this, you've, you've had to back off and come back to the mountain again as you did on K2. Um, tell us a bit more about that. Sure. It's, um, it was interesting for me to learn this sort of difference about failure because, you know, failure is probably something I saw initially as, okay, you do something and if you don't make it, you fail, right? That's how, that's how, uh, you know, uh, Vanessa O'Brien 1.0 probably would have looked at it. And then the more I was out there and the, and the more I was learning through this process, the more and the more the earth was changing even with El Nino and all of these, you know, kind of uh, things that were happening and how they were related or not related to mountains, I started realizing that, wait a minute, you know, failure is not only necessary, but it's, it's actually just a, a data point that we acquire to give us information. Yeah. And that you don't ever really fail unless you give up. So you're, you're never out of the game, so to speak, until you pull the plug and say, I'm not going to do this anymore. And once I put it in, in that, into that perspective, I thought, you know, wow, I wonder how many people really think like that. Because people probably do something and think, oh, you know, I did really poor on that test. Like, you know, and then they feel really bad and, you know, they go beat themselves up or something. But you know, all they have to do is go back and like figure out, you know, where they need to look at, what they need to look at more or something like that. It's just a different way to look at it to say, no, you know, you're, you're not done. You haven't failed because you, you're not out. You haven't given up. 
Like that attitude is so much, so yeah. powerful. And and, and that's a great way to look at it. I, I just, I just love that. And it's not an excuse for like people who, you know, don't do something right to go back again. It's just, it's a, it's a different mindset that says, if you seriously gave something your best shot and things outside of your control made it impossible, but you really learned something and you really, really want it, then by all means, keep going. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, it's that trade-off. It's powerful stuff, Vanessa. So how do you train? I mean, in, a, in an ongoing sense, um, you know, like, like now, um, how do you stay in, in good fitness? Um, and then how do you prepare for, for particular objectives? Yeah, so right now is, is a terrible time because of COVID. Of course, I haven't trained in a, in a while. Um, but to answer your question for when I was training, first is you, you can't make excuses. Don't, if you're living in a city and you say, I'm going to go every weekend and drive an hour to get to, you know, whatever, that perfect hiking place, don't do it. Don't, don't set something in your head that's not, that's potentially not going to happen because you're setting yourself up for failure. I knew when I was training for K2 that I was, you know, spending a lot of time in New York City in a concrete jungle and I was never going to get far enough outside of New York to make that happen. Um, I was lucky enough to find a partner in uh, Vernado who uh, owns and manages some of the tallest buildings in New York City. And of course, you know, everybody's afraid after, you know, 9-11 and, you know, who, who's who and all this stuff. But it just took a couple of phone calls um, and I was able to get a pass, you know, a badge. And I just started start climbing the stairs. The, the stairs of tall buildings are perfect. Um, you have to obviously be creative, you know, uh, skip every other one sometimes, wear a weighted vest. Um, you know, uh, I remember doing this a couple of times and I was, they have a fireman's drill every once in a while where they raise money for charity. And I started coming down a little too quickly. And finally, the, one of the security guys said, you don't really work here, do you? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're coming down too fast. <laughs> and then he, he had my name up on the screen and he had Googled me. I was like, oh, you know, I thought he was going to pull my badge. And then he was like, no, it's, what are you training for? You know, so it was all cool. I bought That's them like Dunkin' Donuts and like stuff and, you know, we celebrated. And But, um, you know, people generally like to, you know, will support you and stuff. But, you know, just just find find a good partner to help you. I, I always find it hard to ask for help, I'll be honest. But... I'm, I'm getting better at it. I, I think if you, if you're out there and you need help for things like staircases or help for training, you know, just, t just let people know what you're trying to do. You'll be surprised how many people will offer help. But if I had said I was going to drive every weekend to go somewhere, I know I would not do that. Yeah. So well, you got to be creative. You've got, you've got to take advantage of what you find in your backyard. And you found skyscrapers, and uh, yeah. that's a great, great way to get that cardiovascular going. But it was interesting. You, you've told me about um, the when you came across the first female guide on Mount Rainier and an interaction you had with her about when she was asking for volunteers to stay behind. Tell us about that. Yeah, sure. I, it was an interesting experience because I had wanted to climb Everest and um, I, you know, I, I failed the first time. So people will see that in the book. And so I asked the guide what I need to do to succeed. And he gives me a list. And on this list is Mount Rainier. So I climb Mount, I, I sign up for Mount Rainier. And uh, this is a season that's really tough with a lot of snow and uh, it's, it's a pretty big group, I think 10 people or so. And we get to, you know, sort of the summit push and she notices that we're not all kind of moving as fast as we should be. And so she says something really interesting that I, I had really never heard before. And that's why it stuck out to me is, is she 
gathers us all around and she says, you know, I, I have good news and I have bad news. You know, the good news is, um, you know, weather looks good and the summit pushes on. Uh, but the bad news is, is we're not all moving fast enough uh, to get there as a team. So we have a decision to make. Um, would some of you like to stay behind and allow some to go for the summit? Or do you want to all come together and see how far we can get as a team? And I was like, oh, oh my God. Like, I just, I was so shocked by, by this, this uh, choice put before this open committee of climbers because everything I had experienced up to then was uh, male guides who were very, very uh, command and control, who ve very clearly would have said, you, you, and you are moving too slow. You stay back. The rest of us are going up. It, it just would have, it would have rolled like that. There's no doubt. Or everybody's moving too slow, nobody's going, but absolutely they would have divided. There, there would never have been this kind of discussion. And I was just, I was, I was amazed and baffled by it. But worse, because it was put in the open, there was this silence. And I, and I thought, oh no, like, I've got to break the silence because if, in times like that, the loudest voice wins the majority argument in my experience. And so I immediately chimed in and said, no, you know, in the spirit of Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, we must get somebody to the summit, you know, eat, like proverbial teamwork, just get somebody up there. I don't care who it is, um, but we should see a summit. You know, so far there's been no summits. Now, of course I said that knowing I was one who would opt in. I don't know what it would have felt like if I had, if I was one that was going to opt out. But the interesting thing is, is that she wasn't choosing people to opt in or out. She was asking people to self-identify, but to do that, you had to be up for it. So there was sort of that lens that said, I'm watching you, be careful what you choose. And so of course the next day, only myself, one other woman and an Italian guy end up going. So a lot of people stayed back. So it was a forceful move, an interesting move, one that was open communication, collaboration, and um, really left it to the team, but I've really never seen it uh, before or again. It's fascinating. Yeah, very. You also talk about on, on your expeditions, observing over time, and obviously with all the difficulties and challenges of weather and so on, a sort of a dwindling cast, and you mentioned like a, an Agatha Christie mystery. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I couldn't resist. I do say an expedition is like a, a, a dwindling cast in an Agatha Christie play. I'm sorry for that uh, analogy. But, um, but a lot of it is, um, what I like to say is, is down to fear. And it's... Um, a lot of it is, is psychological, unfortunately. Um, and what tends to happen, and these are long expeditions, so for people who are just listening in and wondering, why are people so fearful? It, it's not that, these are long expeditions. These are you know six to eight weeks in a very uncomfortable environment where people are living outdoors, no heat, uh, extreme conditions, you know, on a glacier, uh, miserable. And, uh, you know, they're hearing avalanches, they've been climbing high, they've been stuck with weather. Uh, they're hearing people who are getting sick and uh, coughing and getting all sorts of pneumonia and bronchitis and things like that. So, you know, the dwindling cast comes down to uh, the cascading effect of, as things start to, to worsen and time goes on, the fear starts to spread because they'll, they'll see one avalanche and then they'll look at the weather reports and everything starts to be sort of heading in a really negative direction. And then psychologically, they'll start checking out mentally where they are. And when you start to check out mentally, it's very easy to let other things come in. Um, and there is no door on any of the tents per se. In other words, you can always go home, but you've got to remember what's keeping you there. And I always like to encourage teams to stay focused on the summit. 
um, you know, there's lots of things we can do. We can uh, have quizzes, we can have movie nights, we can, you know, do all sorts of things together. But if they start um, spreading fear and misery loves company, so you can find the people who like that fear and want to tell stories about fear, um, you know, you can find yourself getting sick and coughing and, you know, remembering the stuff you're missing at home and suddenly one goes, two goes, you know, and you watch this trickle effect and otherwise completely healthy and normal people start to leave and it's unfortunate. But, um, you know, I think some people psychologically look for excuses to go and that's okay too. You know, it's, the mountain provides that uh, for them uh, because it's hard. It, there's a lot of work ahead, a lot, a lot of work ahead. Uh, and it's not fun. I, you don't have to have fun to have fun. I don't think that's my original quote, but uh, it's it's you're not having fun when you're there. It's the it's the reward of being able to accomplish it. That is what's uh, incredibly um, uh, a feel good moment about that. It, it's not the actual moment of climbing. <laughs> I, I often think of mountaineering as substantially being a retrospective pleasure because yes. the, the actuality of many parts of it, I mean, they, they obviously there are great moments, but there are times where you are going, what am I doing here? Or I'm really scared and concerned about what's what's going to, um, going to happen, happen next. Um, but what do you think are the, the key factors for being successful on a big mountain. Um, you wrote about four critical factors for summiting. Can, can you tell us a bit more about your formula in many respects? Oh gosh, I, I'm sure whatever I wrote there was probably very cheeky. It was probably something like, uh, you know, uh, luck and God's willingness to pull your name out of a hat or something like that. Um, but, you know, I, I think you do, you have to be, you have to be prepared, you have to train, you have to, you know, you have to have, you have to be there mentally and, uh, you know, emotionally, spiritually, uh, you have to be up for that. Uh, you have to focus on what you can control and not control and know the difference. Uh, you have to want it. You have to remember what's there because when everything else goes wrong, you have to remember what's going to make that leg lift of yours when all else uh, fails. Uh, so you're, it's, it's sort of like the mental, uh, people disagree how much is physical versus mental. I, I think there's a lot of mental in it because it's just such a long slog on an endurance spectrum. And the physicality of yourself will uh, dissipate uh, because of the conditions that you're in, but the mental must stay intact. And, um, you know, if you're provided with the right window, uh, you can do this. Of course, a lot depends on, you know, the conditions of the mountain at the time, being able to, you know, thread needles, um, you know, uh, having the right team, you know, I, I, I don't ever recommend really climbing alone because I think it's, it's dangerous um, to be in these places alone. Um, but I, uh, I think, I think there, and there, there's always a little bit of element of luck. I, I think that that's probably true. Um, you know, if I look at the Sherpa, even on their success in winter K2, you know, um, it was incredible that they were able to to um, you know, do that during the small weather window they did, and you know they had five summits and or sorry ten summits and five deaths. So it was an incredibly risky venture, even on winter K two. Incredibly risky and, and an incredible achievement. What a wonderful thing for Nepal, I think. Yeah, of course. But, you know, it's interesting. I, I agree with you about that sort of psychological, mental aspect of mountaineering. I, probably somewhat facetiously have often said to people that I think high altitude mountaineering is 95% mental and, you know, for, for want of want of a number. But I, I think it really does come down to that grit and determination. And clearly you've, um, you've demonstrated that in buckets. But tell us a bit about your climb of Everest. Um, you know, I know you, you had issues with 
avalanches, you, you've had issues with oxygen. I think um, one of your guides wasn't well, and, and all of a sudden the, the summit was in jeopardy. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so that's the that's the first time I attempt Everest. Um, so I, I do do Everest twice, if you will. The first time I, I go uh, after... Uh, you know, having trained uh, uh, on Fox Glacier, and I think, okay, you know, uh, when I'm attempting the Camp 2, and I, uh, actually, it's an interesting experience, because in, I, I think, when I think back, I'm very grateful for the initial uh, tumble, if you will, and I guess we can call it a tumble, because if I had succeeded very, very early I think I would have become a, a very different, I would have a very different perspective. I think um, this, this early experience really was important for me to put things in perspective. And what happens is I, I catch uh, pulmonary edema and um, we are trying to get halfway through the Kumbu Ice Fall uh, to the football field as it's called. And there is an avalanche that takes place in uh, just the Sorox, not just the Sorox, but, you know, just, uh, it's just in the ice fall. But, you know, it's, it's a very frightful place to be caught. And as we would see later, years later, of course, you know, a deadly place, it would oversh overshadow the worst of 1996. And, uh, and par partially why it's so deadly is there's no real protocol of what to do in an ice fall because you, you can't, hide under something tall, you can't slide into something open, you can't, uh, you know, all these uh, safety things snap like a twig, you know, um, everything slides, it's, it's just, it's, it's like a war zone. And uh, the normal things of self-arrest just don't apply, you, not there, it's, it's, it's just, it's the one place you just can't slam an ice axe and, and, you know, take cover, right? It's, it's, there's ladders, you know, two or three across and, it's just a nightmare place. There's no perfect answer of what to do. And uh, as I tell the story, I'm, I'm, you know, we're sort of watching this thing unfold like a video game and, you know, all this stuff kind of sliding toward us. And, and I'm looking at all the talismans around my neck. And I think I give um, St. Christopher sort of a oh, I don't know what sort of accent that is. Uh, hey, love, you know, like I got this one. Um, and I, I think he uh, he stands up and, and sort of uh, puts the brakes on uh, the shrapnel coming toward us and, and uh, stops it. Uh, but we're, we're just in horror watching the thing uh, come toward us. And then we get down. But of course, I do have pulmonary edema and uh, I eat an enormous slice of humble pie as I, uh, you know, back out of there. Um, but that was a great experience in that it taught me that the high altitude medicine was something I had to learn about, that I needed to train uh, for VO2 max and not put on muscle weight because the brain and the lungs must have that uh, limited um, uh, resource of oxygen. You don't want uh, you know, muscle to take that away. Uh, you know, I would meet people like Dr. Peter Hackett, you know, who has been wonderful in supporting, you know, the expeditions with, with med kits. And, you know, if, if, if terrible things like that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have gone down the taking responsibility route that I did. And so it was better that it happened to me early so that I could learn early and, and take more responsibility early. And uh, so there's a, there is a silver lining if things go wrong for people and that's, um, you know, it'll make you uh, more switched on and better later. Well, that's so true. You, you learn from your experiences, you come back better, you know, they have that opportunity. But what about um, higher up on the mountain where, where you talked about um, issues with your oxygen system stopping and, and the, the guide who was taking you up having second thoughts, tell us about it. Oh gosh, um, I, I think I know this one too. This is um, so. This is the actual ascent of Everest, and uh, this is an interesting one too because this is the first year. Uh, it, it dovetails with climate change as well because uh, in 2012 is interesting for a couple of, of reasons. This is the first year of the queue, 
So people talk about 2019 and all this, the, the photos NIMS took and everything, but they forget 2019 was the first year we actually saw those photos, right? And 2019 or 2012 was interesting also because the Lotsi face was so dry that there was rockfall coming down and Sherpa were getting hurt, hurt really bad, uh, you know, cranium uh, hits to the head and everything else. And uh, a, a couple of, uh, of the guides uh, said, you know, we really can't climb the Lotsi face as we know it. We're going to have to take the old 1953 route and go around the way that your father would have climbed it uh, back in the day. And um, it's longer, um, takes a little bit more time, but it's less steep because you're not going straight up. And so some of the old timers, um, not that old, of course, but, you know, they remembered this route. Uh, you know, we, we walked around and, and found it. And of course you still have to go up because you're, you gotta get higher. Um, and this is before the yellow band, but you, you, you can climb another high wall. And so, well, we were trying to figure all this stuff out. That's great, um, you know, but we didn't get an acclimatization uh, uh, rotation at camp three. So everybody's a little bit worried. Um, we get to the point where we're, we're doing the climb and somebody says, well, listen, since you didn't get the acclimatization hike, why don't you use oxygen going up to three? And I'm a little nervous because I really, my, my, uh, my rule about oxygen and, uh, you know, every climber has their thing. And really the UIAA, I will point out, it does not even say any rules on oxygen. It's really down to the individual and their, uh, their body needs for this. So I know a lot of people like to say, you know, what is appropriate or not appropriate, but there are there are actually no rules on this. My personal rule on this is that I believe strongly that oxygen should be used at or above 8,000 meters. Now, I say this because I come from, as a mountaineer, from households that had people with no hands or feet, and I come from climbers who have lost hands and feet. So I don't believe that this activity should leave somebody maimed for life. And um, I know what, what being above the death zone does to a human body. And I know how I cannot trust the weather and the jet streams for certain periods of times. So I, I, it's just, it's safety. And I don't know why you would have, why you would have something that you would not use and be arrogant about it. For me, it makes no sense at all, but that's just me. So I, I'm not talking about climbing style or anything else. I'm talking about what I consider saving somebody's uh, digits. So I did not want to take oxygen sooner because for me, it's just extra weight, 10 to 12 pounds. I don't need the weight. I don't need the oxygen, you know, I'll wait till 8,000 meters because I had climbed two peaks, eight to, two 8,000 meter peaks back to back. I now knew what this was about. No, 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 DD, DD, you should do this. Mm -hmm. You know, really, it's going to help you. This is Everest, it's different. Anyway, I put this thing on, getting up the face. Of course, the face, no matter even if it's less of a face, still has front pointing. So I go to the point, I'm pointing down, putting in the, the front point. I look down, and it is as if somebody has put their hand over my mouth and gag me. And the minute that happens, that split second, when you take that breath, thinking that you had air and you didn't have air, the fight or flight symptoms come through your head and it says, you're, you're dead. You're, you're out of oxygen, you're going to die. And that was, the, I think the first time that's ever happened to me and it was fascinating how the, how the chemicals go through your bloodstream how the brain tells you you're you're going to die, and that and you can't turn it back. In fact, now now that I've experienced it, I realize when people talk about fear, fear can't be planned. Fear happens instantly, just like that. People who say they're afraid have never felt that. When you really think you're going to die, when your whole blood vein takes over and and the thing in the brain the chemicals that go through and yes there goes there goes the pants there goes the urine i am just peeing and it was awful 
awful. It's like the sym sympathetic nervous system or something. I don't know, but it was just, oh my God, it was so embarrassing. But I really, really thought that was it. I thought the oxygen was gone. And I, but so what's happening is I'm, as I look down, my hose is twisted. And as I look up, the hose untwists. And it takes me two times to do that to figure out like I can breathe. And voila. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, oh, it was so scary at first, though, because that first thing that goes through your head is death. And and it's hard to it's hard to for the brain to talk itself out of that death once it happens. So fascinating. Yeah. Tell us about when you got to the top. I mean, it, I think for everyone who climbs great mountains, K2, Mount Everest, it's a pretty special moment. It's a fleeting moment, too, isn't it? Yeah, so for Everest, it was, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's surreal because, you know, Everest is, is in a way beautiful because it does have the prayer flags up there. So you, you see the prayer flags are so beautiful anyway, the colorful, they're up there. It's, I, I say in the, in the book, it's about the size of a king size mattress. So there are a few people that can be up there at a time. Um, I I am the first up there of my team with my Sherpa. And uh, I realized my camera batteries don't work. And just recently, uh, in from 2012, maybe 2011, something like that, they had asked for some photos as proof. This wasn't always the case. It, uh, that rule had come in relatively recently. So I was a little afraid because, you know, I, I needed photographic proof. And so my batteries, um, my backup batteries, my camera, all this stuff doesn't work. But then I see my um, uh, my Finnish uh, climbing mate comes up behind me. And so uh, he takes my photo and uh, I'm just, I think I call him hero of the day because, uh, you know, in the film or the sequel, like, you know, he's, he's going he's gonna to have a, a Superman outfit on for sure, because that's, <laughs> that saved me big time. You wouldn't want to do that twice just for a photo. So yeah, that, that was great, but it, it's surreal. And I think uh, as soon as you do what you need to do, you know, you're taking it all in the, the, you know, the mountains and the, the you know, if you get a good day, the, the, the view is, is forever. And you know, a sip of something, a drink of something, but then you realize like, oh, you know, you got to get down and down is, is, uh, you know, down's a lot of work. You're only halfway when you're on the summit. How did you feel with K2, tagging with someone in K2 is that one of the great accomplishments in, in high altitude mountaineering? How was that for you? Yeah, you know, I, I'll tell you, I, th I think um, in retrospect, people always say, you know, which, what's your favorite mountain or things like that, you know, I, I think you, you almost have to say that the thing that makes you work the hardest is, is always going to give you that, uh, the answer for that in, in that, you know, K2 made me work the hardest. It took three years. I mean, you know, it's, it's unbelievable in a way that everything had come to me on the first try and then K2 made me take three years of my life. You know what I mean? That's, that's a hell of a long time. The gray hairs that come from that, you know what I mean? Um, it made me work like no mountain, right? I mean, I, I, unbelievable when people think, oh yeah, I'll do two mountains, you know, but that could have been six mountains. Uh, it made me work unbelievably hard. And uh, I don't regret it, of course, because, you know, I, I found Pakistan and, and, you know, so many other things that came from that. But, you know, uh, getting a camp hire every year gave me hope. Um, and, but standing at the top of it, it it's, it's a tough mountain. There's, there's really nothing easy about it. You know, we very much looked at that Serac and um, at the top and, and the team that had gone, I think, two or three years before us, we, we went. It's, it's quite funny if I were to try to draw a box, but the Italians, 
and 54 went right over the rock. They were great rock, they were great out, they were great rock climbers. And the last team that had gone before us went way over here. So they had to go, the, they traversed a lot of spent a lot of time under that big Ciroc. And so we didn't want to spend a lot of time under the Ciroc. So we went up a gully that was like kind of in the middle. So we were very strategic about where we were going to come up. We didn't want to go up the rock, like 54 Italians. We didn't want to spend so much time under the big popcorn Ciroc. So we really spent, we tried to like hit in the middle. But I'll tell you, no matter what you do, it's, uh, it makes you work for every single step. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that. I, I don't think I could ever do it again. Um, you know, because it's, it's, you know, it's hard work and it, you know, I think you'd always go for something else before you did something twice, but, but I am, um, you know, I, I am keen, I suppose, to um, take one uh, look to see if we can find, um, you know, John Snorri and Ali Sapara, who, who perished, of course, in, in winter K2. So um, I would at least go to put the plaques up for them. Tell me, do you still have the Mario Andretti ring that Jim Clash gave you, or has that gone back? Because I guess that might tell us a little of what your plans are in the future. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't think I could land in the country and keep that for more than 24 hours without him stalking, you know, to, to get that ring back. So, nope, that went back. But I did get my own. I was able to, uh, as a reward, I got my own drive with Mario. And um, you did. I got my own ring. So uh, I don't need his ring to go on with me in the, in the mountains anymore. I can take my own my own ring. So, uh, so what, what lies ahead for you at the moment? Have you got other expeditionary plans? Uh, so, you know, it's interesting. The Challenger Deep really came up at, at an interesting time, you know, rather than the next mountain, um, you know, this, this, this thing about the deep came up, which was interesting because it was sort of, uh, you know, two miles deeper than Everest is tall. And, Going back to this, uh, this thing about climate change, you know, I had always focused so much on the mountains and I was looking at some of the research that was being done in Nepal um, that basically said, you know, a third of these glaciers are gone. If, if you decide that you care about them today, that's fantastic, but there's nothing you can do. You can only care about that second third. And I still don't think people really understand the significance of that uh, because that's powerful and extremely scary. And with Glasgow coming up in COP26, which was postponed, it was, should have been last year, it's coming at the end of this year, uh, I started thinking more about, you know, what, you know, what, what, what is out there? You know, what do people need to know? Because as you said, we're all advocates in one way or another. When the dive came up and I started thinking about wow, is there a message here that can somehow convey and tie in with what was happening up here? It was, it was just perfect. It was perfect because over 70% of the planet is water. Um, you know, we know more about the moon and Mars than we know about the bottom of the ocean floors. 50% of those NASA statistics about um, climate change is ocean related not even atmospheric related and I just started like doing like I always do it starts with information and getting involved on what was happening so that was uh that was an incredibly interesting opportunity to find out how the oceans were impacting the climate change and how they can even absorb 25 percent of that co2 while the atmosphere takes say another 50 percent so they're partners together in this planet um Still a lot to do. In fact, I was I was rereading the book, and I, I had made a um, an interesting assumption about when, we're, when I'm talking about the Boston Marathon and looking at vandalism. And it was interesting because I'm looking at the the Boston Marathon and and how those windows are blown out, and sometimes how I look at mountains and I see climate change and they're impacting. It looks like a haunted house. And you see 
kind of bits of it just broken through and um, glaciers melting and it looks like vandalism. And it's an interesting word if we were to apply, apply that in the same way. We, I haven't heard vandalism applied to it, but if you, if you, you, if you think of that word, it, it has a different connotation to it. So I only mentioned Challenger Deep in that it came to me at a point in time I wasn't thinking about oceans and then I became very excited about oceans. Now, I think of the next frontier and I could think about something like space. Just recently, a gentleman from Japan had come together and said, I want uh, eight to 10 people to come to space with me. And he opened it up to a lottery. So me and yes, 1 million other people. So, <laughs> so I'm not getting my hopes too high for this, <laughs> but you know, imagine like, at least he didn't say he's taking eight of his friends, he actually auctioned it off and said, hey, I'm going around the world and I'm looking for eight other people. And I just think that's great. It just means that there are going to be opportunities in the future to do stuff that we never, that aren't even on our radar today. So I am open to absolutely everything. It's, it's I feel like the book has just, the ink's not even dry. Uh, I'm talking about it. I'm really excited about it. I'm proud of it. Um, but I never expected Challenger Deep to happen. If I say I'll never go to space, next thing I know, I'll be in space. Um, but they all add up to parts of Gaia and this planet that we're on and how it all tells the story. And uh, if I can advocate for anything or help uh, tell any part of the story of the planet, I would be more than happy to do that. I think uh, it's fascinating to learn more. I never expected this to become uh, my uh, vocation, but it uh, it appears to be now. So, uh, well, congratulations know. on the book and congratulations on where this whole process has taken you in terms of, I mean, learning about yourself, learning about the planet, realizing the things that we have to do. I think expeditions do impress on us a sense of responsibility and we all need that and you exemplify that fantastically Vanessa keep on adventuring and I look forward to hearing what you're going to do next but all the best with the book thank you so much Peter thanks for taking the time today it's great it's to see you again Bye -bye.